All right, so I hope everybody's doing well this evening. Um, as you can see, I am not Pastor Ed. Um, Pastor and uh, Miss Janie went down to uh, Myrtle Beach to visit uh, his parents uh, for a little while, so they got out of town. Of course, they know, as he's been telling you over and over again, he is inheriting a puppy here in about two weeks. <laughs> so they're trying to get out while they can. So, um, so filling in for him tonight, and um, hopefully what I got for you guys will bless you. Um, it's something that I've been kind of thinking about for a while um, and kind of building this over the past few months or so. Um, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and go to Hebrews 11. We're going to start in verse 1. Um, so really, like, as I've, you know, been studying the Word and all that stuff, like, my favorite book of the Bible has always been, like, Ephesians. I don't know why I've always just kind of been drawn to Ephesians. I love that book. There's so much in there. you got the Ephesians prayers. You know, it talks about the fivefold ministry. Um, you would be able to do abundantly more than you can ask or think. You know, all those awesome things. But as I've been getting into the book of Hebrews, I've been like, man, this is a really good book. <laughs> um, and so I think Pastor's the same way. He's like, I think he's, Hebrews is one of his favorite New Testament by, uh, books. And so I kind of gotten in that, that zone too. Um, and so Hebrews 11, um, starting off in verse 1, will say, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the, world, the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were made not of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through, through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away, so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he had taken, before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And verse six is where we're going to camp out for a little bit. Uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so the reason I want to camp out here is because this verse. The more and more I read it and the more and more I've heard other preachers talking about it, the more it just kind of speaks to me about who our God is, right? Um, and so the, the message of, or the title of this message is, Who is He? Or Who He Is? Um, and so what we're, we're going to do is I'm going I'm to split this up into three parts. Uh, so the first part of this verse is, uh, I call it part A, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. So that's the first part. And it's kind of all done by the commas and all that stuff anyway, but here we go. Uh, part B would be for he who comes to God must believe that he is. And then part C, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so that's kind of where I'm going to you know, split this up and kind of look at some things. Um, and part A, you know, um, but without faith it's impossible to please him. I'm not going to go too much into this because we have a lot of faith teaching, right? We know what faith is. We know what faith is not. Uh, we know that we have our confessions, um, that we, you know, do what the Word says, and, you know, we were rewarded for that faith. Um, so I'm not going to get too deep into that part, but I do want to mention that this is also said in many other parts. Um, in Habakkuk 2.4, uh, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38, it all says the just shall live by faith, right? So we know that in our life with God, we have to live by faith. It is faith that pleases God. It is faith that activates what God has for us. Okay, and I think we've all had some good teachings on that, right? Okay, so we don't need to go too deep into that. I think we know that. Um, but again, it is, you know, faith is what activates God's power. It's what gets us the things that we need. And so uh, turn real quick over to Psalm 148. Psalm 148. So Psalm 148, uh, verses, uh, verse 13, and I'm reading the New King James for most of this, unless I say otherwise. I've just always been a fan of the New King James. It's what I started with. I'm not saying it's any better than any other one, but I just always kind of had a preference for it myself. Um, you know, sticks in the vein of the King James, but kind of updates the language just a little bit. I don't like the these and the thous, so there we go. 
as you know, pastor calls King Jimmy, right? All right, so uh, Psalm 148, verse 13 says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. All glory is above the earth and in heaven. And so when we talk about this next part, part B, uh, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, um, I want to look at the, the name of God, right? Because it's the name of God that's exalted. It's the name of God that tells us who he is. And as I was kind of... Um, you know, studying this out, I've, I found an interesting statement that I want to bring up through, uh, it, was on, it was on a website, uh, it, was, it was a Jewish website, uh, talking about, you know, the Old Testament names of God. And it says this, um, in Jewish thought, a name is not merely an arbitrary designation, a random combination of sounds. The name conveys the nature and essence of the thing named. It represents the history and reputation of the being named. And so in, in Jewish thought, for, uh, especially, names have power. You know, names are very special. Names have a purpose. Um, as, you know, young uh, Jewish boys and girls are, grow up and they become, you know, men and women, um, they're encouraged to take, you know, a Jewish name that has a meaning and all that stuff behind it. And the reason I get into this is because God has several names in the Bible, right? Um, in the Old Testament alone, there are 16 different names of God. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover those all, but I'm going to cover, I'm going to highlight a few of those just so that we can see uh, with this. Because, again, back in Hebrews 11:6, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. And so I'm kind of looking at that, and there's a couple different thoughts about what this verse means. Um, in some translations, it says that um, they must believe that he exists, okay? And that's not a bad one, you know, I, I, you know. I can deal with that. That's fine. But the way it's written, it, it kind of seems more to me that we have to believe that he is something more, right? That it's, it's not just that he exists, but that he has a character, that he has, uh, a, there, there's more meaning to God. Because a lot of times we think of God as, as just this, you know, thing in the sky, you know, kind of looking down and not really playing an active role. He created everything and just kind of let everything go, Right. And everything's going to kind of work its course. Um, but God is so much more than that, right? He cares more for us than, than we even imagine. Um, he does so much for us that we don't even know. And God is way more than just, you know, a, a thing, right? He's a person. He's a person that desires a relationship with his children. So much so, he sent Jesus to restore that relationship. So that not only could he have that relationship, but he could dwell inside of us, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's huge. I mean, that's, that's big, that God would love us so much that he would do this just so that he could have a relationship with us again, right? Mm -hmm. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see over time God revealing himself to the Israelites more and more over time. Um, we can kind of see that as like a progressive revelation, I guess you could say, um, you know, because after, you know, the Garden of Eden, uh, man was kind of cast away, but then that plan kind of started coming into fruition over time. And throughout that plan, throughout the things that God did, he revealed more about himself. He revealed who he was. And we see that again in the names of God. And so, um, again, back to the, you know, must believe that he is. Uh, for those who come to God must believe that he is. So that comes to, um, really just means approach. So if we're approaching God, obviously we have to have faith, right, to please Him. But if we're approaching Him and coming to Him as if we're in need, that's kind of what that conveys. We're coming to Him as, as if we need something. Um, then we have to believe that He is. Okay? Um, and so let's take a look at a couple of these real quick. Now, if you guys, I mean, you guys know, as you're reading your uh, Old Testament, we see Lord all the time, yes? And it's in capitalized letters, but kind of a small script. And so, with the translations and all that stuff, it, it, it kind of comes across as you just see in Lord all the time. But as we know, that each of those different times Lord is mentioned, it means something. Now, the most, um, the most times it occurs is Yahweh, right? Y-H-W-H. Uh, and that means the Lord, Master, the Omnipotent God, really all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but as we see in different parts of Scripture, Lord means something different. It means something way more than just God or the omnipotent God. And so go ahead and turn over to um, Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Okay, um, so we're going to start in verse 14, um, but really backing up to verse 8, um, this is um, the Israelites going against the Amalekites, and so this is where we have the account of um, Israel going to war, and we have that uh, Moses went up to the mount to you know, look over the uh, battleground, and as long as he kept his hands up praising God, then the Israelites were victorious. We, get, we all know the story, right? Yeah. And then, um, so, when he got tired as the battle drew on, obviously his hands started to dip, and so Aaron and Hur came up and, you know, lifted the hands of, of Moses to help him out so that uh, Israel could get the victory. And we can go into a whole other sermon about that, right? About helping out, you know, those in leadership and all that, but that's not where we're at now. Um, and so, starting in verse 14, um, wait, hold on a second. Sorry, 13. Uh, so, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And in 14, the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it to the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. And he said, Because this Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So, The Lord is my banner in um, the Hebrew is Jehovah Nisi, okay? And so the Lord is my banner. It also can be translated to the Lord is my miracle, okay? And so um, this is kind of an antiquated term, like the Lord is my banner. What does that really mean, right? And when we look back at, especially in old times and even in modern warfare, um, the banner man was somebody who basically held the, the, the banner or the flag of the country or the side, and it was on a very long pole, you know, going up into the sky so that during the battle, the people who were fighting could see where they were, right, where they were supposed to go. So wherever they saw that banner go, they knew that's where they were supposed to go. And if they saw that banner moving very quickly backwards, that means the battle was lost and you better get out of there, right? <laughs> and so, um, so the Lord is our banner, meaning the Lord is always going to lead us into what? Victory, Right? We are victorious in God, yes? He is our banner. He's never going to lead us into a place of defeat. That's not his job, right? Um, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He has come that we may have life and life more abundantly. He's not going to lead us into defeat. He's not going to lead us into bad times. If we're following God, we're following our banner, we're always going to be led into victory, yes? And so we see that, again, in the Old Testament, especially throughout you know, as, as Israel is going to claim the land, victory after victory after victory of God leading them to the right place, right? So in our lives, he is our God, right? He is our banner. He's going to lead us into victory all the time, no matter what, as long as we what? Obey, follow, right? All right. Um, another thing I want to bring up here is that, you know, we're going to talk about the Jehovah this, Jehovah that, and all that, but I want to talk about Jehovah really quickly. Um, because the word Jehovah, um, it means the God who reveals himself unceasingly. You guys know what unceasing means? Never stopping, right? So the God who has revealed himself in the Old Testament, is he the same God that we have today? Right? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unceasingly, he's always showing who he is. And we activate that by our faith, yes? yes? Okay? And so, just because this is in the Old Testament, this happened thousands of years ago, does not mean that it's not for today. All right? He is the same God. Yes. He is our victory. He is our banner. He will always lead us to that area. Correct? All right. Uh, go ahead, if you will, go over to Ezekiel 34. In 
And so, um, again, you know, as, as I was kind of going through this, I've, I've, you know, I've always heard about the names of God. I've heard, you know, pastor preach on it. I've heard, you know, the songs and all that, you know, and, and it, it, you know, it always has an effect. Anytime you're hearing the word, it's building faith, right? But as I started to kind of study it out a little bit more and started to realize um, the things that go into it, it kind of started activating a lot more in me. Um, and so I definitely encourage you um, to study these things out too. Uh, and I'll kind of get to that a little bit later, but it's, it's very important that you also know this stuff, not just because somebody up here is saying it, but because you know it for yourself, right? Okay. Um, so if you're at Ezekiel 34, we're going to start in verse 11. So verse 11, for thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and the valleys and in the inhabited places of the country. That, uh, I'm sorry, did I miss that? Feed on the rich pastures of the uh, mountains of Israel, sorry. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. So in Ezekiel, um, where it says Lord here, it means the Lord is my shepherd. Okay? Um, so we all know, um, you know, a shepherd has a very important job, yes? Um, so if, especially, you know, when we're looking back at these times, um, a shepherd had a, a very tough job because he had to keep all the sheep together, keep them going in the right direction, and all that. Um, and so, as you guys know, like, anybody ever been around sheep? No? You have? They're not the smartest animals. <laughs> they're really not. I mean, they're, they're you know, kind of down there on the intelligence scale. So, sheep will get into trouble on their own. I didn't have to have any, you know, prompting. They'll get into trouble on their own. They'll get, you know, singled out, you know, somewhere else. They'll go get into trouble, and, they, you know, they may find themselves in a bad situation. But we know that with God as our shepherd, when we do get off track, what is he going to do? He's going to get us back on track, right? All right, it talks about how he will always seek out, or he'll leave the 99 to find the one, Right? He'll always be there for us. And so even if we do mess up and we don't, you know, we're not on the right track, there's grace there because God's going to come get us back. Amen. Right? Um, other places where this is mentioned um, is in Genesis 48, 15. Um, this is in Jacob's blessing to Joseph as Jacob is about to, about to die. Um, he uh, refers to God as feeding him all of his life. So he's always been there for Jacob, always been there to you know, make sure he had everything that he needed. Um, Psalm 23, we know this one pretty well, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, that is Jehovah Ra'ah. Okay, Jehovah Ra'ah, R-A-A-H. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. And so the good thing about a shepherd is, does a shepherd want his sheep to die? Why not? This is livelihood, right? If the sheep die, he doesn't get paid, right? Um, and so a shepherd, a good shepherd, is always going to keep his sheep together. He's always going to keep his sheep with him doing the right things because it will hurt him if it does not, right? And so God, obviously, you know, God's not getting paid for us, you know. But the idea is still there. It's important. You know, these sheep back in the day, these were expensive, right? And so they were valuable, and so we are very valuable to God, and he always wants us to be with him on the right track together, okay? Um, obviously, this goes into, you know, a lot of other things as well, but go ahead and go down to Genesis, or go back to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. So this story always gets me, and the reason is because, this is just, this, this kind of boggles my mind. Um, 
All right, so in, in Genesis 22, you know, Abraham finally had his child, right? Not by the, you know, servant, but by his wife, all right? Finally had the true heir, um, and that was Isaac. And so, you know, Isaac's, you know, not, they call him a young lad, so I'm assuming he's probably, I don't know, 10 to 13, 14, maybe around there. Um, and so all of a sudden, he hears the voice of God, Abraham hears the voice of God saying, I want you to go sacrifice your son Isaac, you know, and that's like, well, this is the son you promised me, right? <laughs> How am I going to go sacrifice him? How is that going to make anything, you know, all right? And so they set out, you know, he's got the, they got the wood, he's got his son, got a couple of servants with him, and they get up to the mount uh, where they are going to uh, perform the sacrifice, and it's just Isaac and Abraham walking up there. And Isaac's kind of looking around like, Dad, where's this sacrifice? <laughs> and all he told his sons is we're going to make a sacrifice, right? And um, so they're kind of walking around as they get closer and closer. I, I imagine Isaac is getting a lot more nervous, <laughs> right? Like, there's only two of us here. There's going to be a sacrifice. What is going on here, right? So he says, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering and all that? <laughs> Um, and so Abraham says, um, in verse 8, he says, uh, my, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And so they kept going. So he kept reassuring him, reassuring him. But he gets so far as to actually tying him up, knife in hand, ready to kill his son, when all of a sudden, you know, the voice of the, or the yeah, angel of the Lord comes and says, no, stop, you know, all is good. And then they look behind, they see a ram caught in a thicket, Right? And so that's the sacrifice that he is going to be taking. And I know Isaac, again, had to be like, whew. <laughs> Thank God, right? Because, again, you know, as a young child, you're kind of thinking, what is going on there? I really would like to think about what that conversation would be on the back end as they're going down, but, you know, there you go. And so in um, verse 13, uh, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, so Abraham went and took the ram, offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. In verse 14, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And so this name of God is Jehovah Jireh, okay? meaning the Lord will provide. So what will he provide? That kind of comes to be the question, right? Um, and, as you know, you kind of go on this, it's really whatever you need, right? Whether that's physical needs or, or whatnot, he's there. And he's there to provide those for you. And I, I just, I always think about, you know, as you guys know, you know, in a couple weeks here we're going to the Middle East. And last summer is the first time that we actually stepped out and decided to go out on a mission trip. And as we were talking about it, you know, it came up that we needed, I think it was like $3,500, $4,000, somewhere around there. And um, I'm kind of looking, I'm like, I don't know if we can swing that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, because, you know, at the time, that, that seems like a lot of money. And so we're just like, well, you know, we'll, we'll give this a shot. And we've both been kind of... Um, discouraged in the past because uh, Jess has tried to go on several mission trips and gotten not a lot of money in. Um, I think well, while we were at Rama's second year, uh, she tried to go on a mission trip to Peru, and I think $20 came in. It's a $3,500 trip, right? Um, I wound up, I was, um, I signed up to go to the Navajo Reservation that same cycle, and um, the reason I signed up for that one is because it was only $500. And I thought, well, if no money comes in, I could pay for that myself, <laughs> right? I could come up with 500 bucks. And um, so I wound up going to that. And then, of course, a couple other times she's tried to raise money. And so we're, we're just really, like, just kind of discouraged, really. Like, I don't know if this is going to happen. I don't know if we can swing this or not. And so we just started praying about it and believing God that, you know, he knows what we need. Um, he knows what we need before we even ask it. You know, my God shall supply all your, all your sorry. God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. There we go. Sorry, <laughs> my 
my God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, right? And so we just started confessing that over and over and over again, and then went back to Genesis 22, where, you know, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Jireh. He was Jehovah Jireh. He still is today, right? That unceasing revelation of who he is. And so we wound up getting the money, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, you know, it's you know, kind of trickled in here and there, and everything was fine. And so then it came up for this summer. They wanted us to come back and come for six weeks instead of one. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's a lot more money, <laughs> right? And so um, we got a call from, you know, the pastors over there, and they, they were talking to us, and, um, you know, they asked us if we wanted to come, and we didn't even think about it. We said, yeah, we'll be there. And then we got off the phone, and we are like, are we going to be there? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is significantly, you know, it's, it's quite a bit more money than the first one. And so, um, you know, we, we put it out there. We let everybody know, you know, what was going on. And um, I mean, I was driving to work. This is during Christmas break. And so sometime in January, I was driving to work. And um, I was driving on 840 over to Page High School. And just this thought came up in my head. It's like, you're going to let them down when you can't get there. You know, they're, they're going to be let down. They're not going to be able to do what they need to do because you're not there. You're never going to get this money. And then I just kind of screamed out. You know, I said, no, my God will supply. He told us to go on this trip, right? It wasn't anything we wanted to do. <laughs> well, I mean, we wanted to, but you know what I'm saying. We didn't, we didn't force it. It's not something that we said, you know, we're going to go do this of our own hand. And so God knows he's, he wants us there. It's his job, so guess who's got to pay for it? God's got to pay for it, right? Amen? And so it worked out. Now, we got to a point where ticket prices were starting to kind of go up a little bit. You know, inflation's hitting Turkey, really, uh, hitting the place really hard, right? And it's hitting us hard, too. And so ticket prices are starting to, you know, drastically increase. And so Jess found a, a ticket for a very good price. And we're like, man, we really need to get this, but we don't have the money right now. And so we just kept believing, you know. And uh, 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 let me go back here real quick, because during that time on that, on that way to work, uh, where I kind of came to this conclusion, I just let it go, right? This is not me, my thing to worry about. This is, this is not for me to worry about. And th this is really kind of the first time in my life where, where, where it came to finances I wasn't worried about it. Like, I legitimately was not worried about it at all. It never crossed my mind again. I just knew if that thought popped up, nope, he's got it. And then and that's where, <laughs> like, you, know, you go to Rama and you hear, you know, pastor preach and you hear all these things. When people say, you know, that, that, that word gets in you and it becomes alive, that was that point where that word came alive in me. That's where that Rama dropped in, that spoken word of God, Right? And so it took a long time for it to finally get there, but it did, right? And so now we know that the next time it comes around, it's probably going to be a lot more money that we need, but we also know that it's going to be provided, right? And so that was kind of that, 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 that switch was, was flicked, I guess you can say. And so I never thought about it again until, you know, and then the thing came up with the tickets, and it's like, well, we really need, you know, just this much more. We can go ahead and book the tickets before they go up. And so we said, all right, well, he's got it. A couple days later, somebody, I don't even know him. Jess apparently knows him, like, separated by many, many factors. The rest of the money that we needed through PayPal with the word go. That's all they said. So, you know. <laughs> He's got it. <laughs> and so we're able to book the tickets. Two days later, those tickets went up to about $5,000 each. Now they're still hovering around the six to $7,000. And we got them for a lot less than that. <laughs> all right. So all that to say is the Lord will provide. Whether it's finances, whether it's something that you need, whatever it is, the Lord's got you. Right? Now, sometimes that may not be as miraculous as that, 
I know for me, um, a lot of times, my financial needs have been met a lot of times through extra work, um, through school, opportunities that come up, uh, whether it's tutoring or, you know, working this or working that. Um, but I believe that is just as much God as money coming in physically. Does that make sense? That they look to me, because I have that favor, of looking to me first and saying, hey, opportunity came up to make extra money. Do you want to do it? Sure. I mean, God's not, you can't be lazy. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? You got to put your hand to something. That's where your faith comes in. That's where the, you know, um, my pastor, uh, when I first came uh, back in Oklahoma, he said something to me that, or said something in a service one day that stuck with me ever since. He says, do everything you know to do in the natural until something in the supernatural tells you otherwise, right? And so in the natural, that means work, <laughs> you know? That means taking the overtime or taking the extra duty or whatever it is until you get the whatever to not do that, right? And so that's what, I mean, that's what I've always been able to do is be able to do that extra little bit of work to, to meet that financial need. And again, I think that's just as much God. He's providing that opportunity, yeah. right? Um, so... Again, the Lord will provide all that to say that. All right, this is a really exciting one. I'm excited about this one. Go ahead and go to Exodus 15. I saved this one for second to last for a reason. (laughs) Did I write that right? All right, so Exodus 15, 26. And he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Right? I am the Lord who heals you. This is Jehovah Rapha. Okay? Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. And so, um, again, this is, you know, the account of Exodus, this is the Passover, um, where we get the, you know, the type and shadow of Christ and all that, but um, as Egypt is going through all the plagues, Israel was spared because they obeyed God, because God revealed himself as the healer, right? Um, it also says that, you know, as they, when they exited, when, you know, Pharaoh finally said, that's enough, go, get out of here, I don't want you here anymore, uh, there's not a feeble one among them. There's millions of Israelites there, yes? Not a feeble one among them. That means nobody had any kind of disease, nobody had any kind of sickness, no limps, no arthritis, anything like that. They all walked out of there completely healed and whole. Try to find three million people anywhere in the world and find not one sick one among them, right? That's the promise of our God. He is the God that heals us. Jeremiah 30, 17, I will restore health to you. I will heal all of your wounds. Psalm 103, 3, who forgives all of our iniquities and heals all of our diseases. Amen. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Did that stop with Jesus? Did that stop when Jesus died? No, it became even more part of the covenant, right? By his stripes we were healed. Amen. The Lord is our healer. Um... So, do you guys get a feeling of who God is yet? Right? He's our provider. He is our healer. He is our shepherd. He is our banner. Right? The last one I want to bring up is one that only shows up seven times in the Old Testament. And this is El Shaddai. You guys heard this one before, yes? (laughs) All right, El Shaddai. So, um... I want to kind of break this one down a little bit because the word shad in El Shaddai uh, means, it translates to breast, okay? Um, And so when we think about, (laughs) think about breasts, um, they're used for nourishment, yes? For a child, whenever they're coming and becoming, you know, strong and able and all that, it's the mother's breast that provides that nourishment, and so El Shaddai really comes down to the all-breasty one. 
the God who can provide and nourish everything for us, right? And so throughout the times where El Shaddai is mentioned, it's really all throughout the book of Genesis, it's made in reference to the covenant of Abraham that God made with Abraham. Go and I will make you a father of many nations. I will provide that. I will nourish that, right? I'll make that happen. Um, In Genesis 28 and Jacob's blessing, as Jacob is blessed by Abraham, in Genesis 35, um, God is reaffirming his covenant covenant to Jacob and renaming him Israel. Um, Genesis 48, Jacob recounts the blessing and he's blessing Joseph's children. El Shaddai is the God that's mentioned in every single one of those, the God that will be the nourishing God, okay? And um, it's used in reference to the covenant that God will multiply and supply for the children of Israel, okay? And so, back to, um, excuse me, Hebrews 11.6, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. So what does that mean? We must believe that he is what? Whatever you need him to be, right? Whatever your problem is, whatever you're facing, you need to look at what aspect of God covers that because he covers all of it, right? Anything that we have need of, anything that we want for the most part, he has an answer for it. And where are we going to find that? In the Word of God, right? All right, so let's believe that he is. So God is whoever you need him to be, right? And so in order to get these things, right, we have to, be, we have, to have faith, because without faith, it's impossible to please him. How do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, right? As one person said, by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. You can't just hear it once, right? You got to hear it multiple times, all right? Now, um, in the youth, we're, we're talking with, with kids about faith right now. Um, that's kind of, the, we're doing this, the course by Brother Hagen, and um, the one thing that we always, you know, say is that faith comes by the Word. That you have to always go back to the Word, of course, but you can also get faith through the preaching and teaching of the Word. Now, the ultimate authority, obviously, is the Word, so if the person's not preaching the true Word, <laughs> obviously, you're not going to get faith through that, Right? But if they are teaching and preaching and, and, and showing the word the correct way, you can also gain faith by that. But that's not the primary way you should be gaining faith. You should be doing, getting it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's something that you have to do. This is not a, it's not a, uh, a one-way, one-way relationship, if that makes sense. You can't just sit here and receive and receive and receive and expect to get everything. You have to put in work yourself. Again, we talked about earlier, you can't be lazy, Right? Okay, I'll get into more of that in just a minute. But this brings us uh, to part three or part C of that foundation verse. So we have to have faith to please him, right? And faith comes by hearing. We have to believe that he is. And that belief means that we have to know, right? We have to absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt that that's who our God is. Whether it's provider, whether it's healer, whatever it is, we have to know that we know that we know that that's who he is and that's who he is today. All right? And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In the message, I like the way it says this, at that last part, and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. And this is probably the biggest hindrance right here, is that we don't believe that God wants to do these things. Talk to any... Christian in the world today, and you ask them about salvation, how many are going to agree that salvation is part of the gospel? 100% probably, right? You ask that same group, how many of you believe that God wants to heal you? I'm sorry, how many of you believe that God can heal you? All of them will probably say, yes, he can. Ask him again, how many do you believe that God will heal you? And you start dropping off pretty quick, (laughs) right? That's where it is. But see, it's no different. Because when you came to God, right, when you came to salvation, 
Did you have to have faith? Absolutely. You have to have faith to be saved, yes? Did you have to believe that He is? That He is what? Savior, right? Savior and Lord, exactly. And did you believe that when you came to Him, He would grant you that salvation? Absolutely. Part of the faith, right? So how is it any different for anything else? It's, not, it's that easy. We try to make it more complicated than it really is, but that's all it is. Faith, knowing who He is, and knowing when you approach, you have what you ask. Amen? All right. So, again, we cannot believe that God is a tight-fisted tyrant. He's not up there purposefully keeping those blessings from us and keeping them hidden up and saying, you're not going to get it until you deserve it. Because He already said we deserve it. When we accepted Jesus as our Lord, it was all given to us, right? Now all we have to do is access it. He is the all-sufficient one. He is El Shaddai. Does he run out of blessings? No. If he did run out of blessings, what would he do? Make more. (laughs) Right? He can never run out of blessings. It's always there. That nourishment, that um, provision, that healing, all of it is always, always there for us to access, right? All right, so, and I, and I do want to see, I want to uh, kind of go back to this a little bit. Um, so pastor asked me to, to, to do this on Sunday morning before he preached, right? And as he's preaching on Sunday, I don't know if you got, I think everybody was here, right? That was a great message on Sunday, all right? And that's, that's a message that is, is just fantastic because Again, so many people think that God is just out to get them or something, right? But it says, you know, in, in, uh, in John 14, like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? If we look at the life of Jesus, we see who the Father is. We see his heart and what he wants to do. Did Jesus ever deny anybody? Everybody who came in faith got what they wanted, got what they needed, right? Whether it was healing, whether it was provision, whether, you know, it was the tax money out of the fish's mouth, whatever it was, right? They got it because they accessed it through faith, believing that he is that provider, but also believing that he will do it, right? Okay? Um, he He never gave anybody cancer. Not once did the disciples have to worry about finances. Do we ever see anywhere in the Gospels where the disciples had to worry about finances. Never. Did they have to worry, ever worry about what they were going to eat that night? Because he can take one loaf and make it into many, right? He can take one fish and make it into many. He can do these things. This is God we're talking about, yes? Um, now, another thing I want to, uh, like, okay, I'm going I'm to use this word liberal, but not in the way you think it is, all right? Liberal just means... A lot of, yes? Generous, okay? Jesus is liberal. He's liberal because he wants to give you all these things. He's a generous, God is generous. Yes? He's not, he's not holding it back. So, I, I, and to even prove this, like in the Gospels, he's so liberal, he's so giving, that even the centurion who was outside of the covenant came to Jesus in faith, and what happened? Got what he needed, right? The Syrophoenician woman, out of the covenant. She said, How, he, Jesus even said, like, why would I give this to you? You're not part of the family. He's like, well, even the dogs get the crumbs. Yeah. Faith, right? <laughs> so be it, right? That's how liberal God is. He's willing to do it for everybody, right? And the only exception, I, I had this in here, this is hometown, Right? I remember that. Lack of faith. <laughs> Familiarity, all that good stuff, right? All right, so again, those who diligently seek him. Um, diligently seek comes down to uh, to seek out for oneself, to crave, and to demand of. We have to put a demand on it, right? We have to put a demand on it. Um, so again, there's really no secret to all this. Um, You know, we see a lot of mini books and stuff like that saying, you know, the seven steps to this or the five steps to that. 
Really, what do they all come down to? Faith, right? Believing, knowing that he is, knowing that he will give it to you. It's all faith, right? The faith comes by and, 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 <laughs> right? And hearing, and hearing. <laughs> all right, so, and I, I just kind of want to, like, leave off with this. I know I, I ran kind of short here, but... Um, you know, I, I teach history in school. I teach world history. And um, especially in my AP class, um, I have to tell my students every year, and they don't believe me at the beginning of the year. It takes them a little while. But I tell them, I cannot teach you everything. 900 years, it's from 1200 to present, 900 years of human history. I cannot do it in 45 minutes a day, 180 days in the school year. It's not going to happen. What am I going to cover? The highlights. I'm going to cover the important stuff, the stuff that you absolutely have to know, right? But all the other stuff, guess who's going to have to do it? They're going to have to do it. They have a textbook. And I've, I've provided them with some guiding questions as to what they should be looking for in that textbook. The ones who do it, they excel very well. The ones who don't, not so much. Right? Barely get by, yeah. Because I don't know if you guys know, but with a, with the AP class, there's a test they take at the end of the year. Um, it's it's um, written by a, a college board. It's a company that does like the ACT, SAT, and all that. It's a long, it's a four-hour test. There's a lot of multiple choice. They have to write three essays and all that stuff. Like it's it's a bear. And um, I tell them, I said, you know, I can't I can't teach it all to you, but if you want to pass that test, because if they pass it, they get college credit. So if you want to pass that test and save some money in the long run, you're going to have to do what I say. <laughs> and the ones who do, do well, right? They pass it. They get what they need. The ones who don't listen, well, maybe they'll get it next year, right? <laughs> but that, uh, the whole point of that is to say that pastor can't teach you everything. As much as he wants to and as much as he knows and as much as, you know, as, as, as smart as he is and as much as he can give, he can't give it all to you, right? So that means that we have to take responsibility and look into it ourselves as well. He hasn't called us to be two-hour-a-week Christians. What does Joshua 1.8 say? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Right? So, if you want to believe that he is, you're going to have to get in the word. Because I'm going to tell you, so many people have fallen away from this message. People I went to school with. People who, in my class, on the outside looked like they were the most devoted, shouting people. But today, because they didn't get into the word for themselves, they've fallen away. It's sad. We have people who have fallen away completely, but people who have just fallen out of the word of faith and are now just going to a mainline denomination because they didn't get their healing. It's because they didn't know who God was. Right? So, I would encourage you guys to continue... I know everybody in here is awesome, but to continue feeding yourself every day. Feed yourself every day. Know that he is. Know that he is a rewarder of you who diligently seek him in whatever situation that you need. Amen? Well, I pray you guys were blessed on that. <laughs> All right, so uh, go ahead and take up the offering real quick. Get that out of the way, yes. Um, does anybody have a physical offering to give? So we'll get to that in a second. Uh, what did God say about giving? First he said to give, <laughs> right? What was the result? And it shall be given, right? Good measure. Press down. Do you believe that? That's faith, right? <laughs> What's that? It works. 
It's faith, isn't it? Knowing that when you put that money in, that he is what? He's faithful, just. He is your rewarder. He's your provider. Amen? And he will reward you for diligently seeking him. Amen? All right, so let's pray over the offering real quick. Uh, Lord, we thank you for those um, who give today. Uh, we thank you that you have opened up the windows of heaven and poured us out a blessing that we don't have room enough to receive. We thank you that by faith, these people have been giving and that you will provide, you will be their Jehovah Jireh throughout all that they need. Lord, we thank you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. If anybody has that offering, you go ahead and go. All right. This is the time in class. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> so if not, uh, thank you guys for joining us online. Um, as Pastor Ed always says, if you're online, please come and join us in person. Uh, 6302 Walter Wright Road and Pleasant Garden. We're just so many miles off the interstate. I can't remember how many. <laughs> Four. <laughs> All right. So, but we would love to. Uh, we would love for you to be here with us. Um, but until next time, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. At next.